We are so delighted that you stopped in today. Our desire is to provide you with scriptural teaching to bolster your personal walk with God. I trust you'll enjoy the selection. May you receive it with an open heart and a spirit of prayer. God bless you all. Praise the Lord, everyone. The Lord. Can we give the Lord a hand clap of praise? Amen. Oh, we magnify your name, Lord. Blessed be the name of Jesus. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. What a joy to be with you. You may be seated. What a joy to be with you again tonight in the wonderful city of South Haven, Mississippi. I have had the privilege of being in South Haven, Michigan and ministering there in a Spanish church. And I have been privileged to be in South Haven, Mississippi. I just like South Haven, I guess. Amen. God is great wherever we be, whether it's South Haven, North Haven, or who, who knows? West Haven, yes. That's where I went to grade school, by the way. West Haven. But uh, it's always good to be in the house of God. Amen. And I greet you in the name of the Lord. I appreciate your wonderful pastor allowing me an opportunity to be with you. And uh, deeply appreciate Brother Sandy and his wife. And uh, they have been friends uh, to the Smith clan or the Smith family for many, many, many years. And I am a benefactor of a relationship that, uh, that was started many years ago. And uh, we certainly love and appreciate them. It's good to see I have a fan club tonight. I've got a couple nephews back there. And uh, if they don't preach with me, well, I'll come back there and I'll sit on their lap and preach. Is that all right? But they're going to help me out. Amen. Praise God. Amen. It's good to see Brother Victor McDonald. I could tell you a few stories about him, but, but uh, <clears throat> I accept briberies after service, Brother McDonald. Thank you. There you go. I had the joy of being in his wedding, and uh, it's good to, to see that God has blessed him and their marriage. And, uh, you know, time passes by, but the grace of God does not stand still. And God always meets us every day we rise. He always blesses us and edifies us and ministers to us. Amen. It's good to see my uncle John here tonight. And uh, he, is, he is a special man. And I love him dearly, Aunt Margie. Appreciate them being here. I'm going to try to share with you tonight from what I feel in the Word of God. But I have made careful scrutiny of the congregation tonight and found a scapegoat among us. My Sunday school teacher, Sister uh, <laughs> Sister Jenkins is here. So if I am out in left field somewhere, just blame it on Sister Jenkins because she taught me, well, maybe not everything, but she taught me a lot. I was, I was speaking to her before service tonight, and, and uh, <clears throat> uh, well, she was noticing my daughters, and they are beautiful ladies, and I am privileged to have such beautiful young girls christian girls all baptized in the precious name of jesus filled with the holy ghost i'm a rich man i'm a rich man and uh, she was commenting on none of them looking like me and i said yes and the fortunate thing is none of them act like me either and uh, sister jenkins could have could appreciate that fact i assure you amen but isn't god good isn't he wonderful Somebody's going to get baptized tonight. I like that. Hey, that's exciting news, folks. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. And I congratulate that, that gentleman, amen, for his heart and desire to serve and to please God. And uh, it will be a, an occasion that you will never forget. That's right. And uh, it, is, it is a joy to be buried with him in the precious name of Jesus. If you'll stand with me tonight, I want to go quickly to the word of God. 
draw your attention to one verse of scripture that is found in the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2. <clears throat> now I will warn you from the very outset, I am not short-winded, so I hope you brought a lunch, or would it be a supper now? I, I do not preach by the clock. I try to preach until I feel that I have delivered and you have received. Um, I've said this before, the faster you hear, the faster I preach. I, I do not do well when I feel a resistance to truth. I tend to just sit there until I win. My perseverance in the Word of God is, is, um, is conveyed. But I do want to do my best tonight to not hold you uh, unduly. And there in the book of Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 8, I want to direct your attention to one verse of Scripture. Praise God. How many brought your Bibles tonight? Isn't it good to have the Word of God? Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Chapter 2, verse number 8 of the book of Ephesians, most of you could probably quote the verse, says this, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Will you read it with me tonight? All together. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Amen. Brother Sandy, pray God's blessings tonight. of Jesus. Praise God. Uh, let's clap our hands to the Lord tonight. Thank you, Lord. 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 Hallelujah. <laughs> Bless him in the name of Jesus. Oh, my soul. I magnify you. I praise you. I honor you tonight, Lord. Praise God. You may be seated. I am a product of my environment, and my environment is a, a wonderful man by the name of Vondas Ardell Smith, my father. And uh, uh, he has ingrained in me in the years of my youth that if we are going to preach or teach, we better find a rhyme and a reason for everything that, we've, that we acclaim or claim that is in Scripture. So I have a tendency to use a lot of verses of Scripture. And uh, you can obviously, if you want, uh, copy them down, try to follow me. I, I, I learned a long time ago, if I just write them all down, then I can move along a little bit more quickly. Amen. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through a lot of uh, scripture tonight. And I want you to hang on because I do have a point and I have something that I believe that God has for us tonight. Amen. I, I, I really believe that God wants to minister to us. Can you say amen? I am convinced that the accuracy of the scripture is absolutely imperative. It is critical, if you will. John chapter 8 and verse 32 says this, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Amen. Come on now, wait a minute. Amen. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free or make you free. Get back into the book. And the Bible tells us that you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Is there a difference between the word make and set? Absolutely. Is there a difference? Does it matter? Absolutely. Might it affect your relationship or your walk with God? Absolutely. Accuracy of scripture is imperative. Somebody help me now. Amen. John chapter 3 and 16 said, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Right? right. Wrong. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth not on him but thank you. Come on now. You're going to have to watch me because I get all confused sometimes. Amen. Praise God. It's on. 
Oh, that was Brother Victor getting mad at me. Everybody look at Brother Victor and say, shame. shame. All right. Praise God. Accuracy of Scripture is imperative. You've got to be straight. You've got to know it. You've got to know what it says. Matthew chapter 5 and 18 says, For verily I say unto you, not till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. It is imperative, folks. It is important that we get to know what the Bible says, that we get it straight, that we get it accurate, that we quote it to, amen, to the letter of the law and to the dotting of the I and the crossing of the T. Amen. The Bible tells us in the book of Mark, chapter 16, 16, he uh, he that believeth and is baptized, the same shall be saved. It frustrates me, it boggles my mind uh, that there are hundreds, even thousands, perhaps of ministers across the globe, uh, even this nation that would like to tell you that baptism is an option, it's an elective, it's something you can do or cannot do. I don't understand where they come from. I don't know where they get their authority to make such assertions, but the Bible that I read tells me, and Jesus said it of his own lips, if you will, amen, that he that believeth and is baptized the same shall be hey folks we need some accuracy of the word of God if you don't accept it like it is there's some consequences it just takes a little leaven to leaven the whole bunch it just takes a little error to make a whole lot of confusion people we gotta know what the Bible says Romans chapter 8 5 and 8 says this but God committed his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners Christ died. Does the Bible say that God died? It doesn't say God died. Does the Bible teach us about an, uh, about an eternal son? Does the Bible talk about God the Son? Does the Bible talk about God the Holy Ghost? Amen. The Bible doesn't. You need to have an understanding. You need to have an accuracy. You need to know what the Word of God says because it's not just something that pertains to an immediate or something that is trivial, but we find in the Word of God the words of life. And if you don't get them right, you may just possibly affect the efficacious power of the word of God we need to know the truth praise God amen so an accuracy in scripture inaccuracy of scripture can have devastating effect we, we can literally uh, hinder or destroy or, or corrupt that blessed hope of salvation in Christ Jesus by inaccuracy of the scripture unrealistic expectations can evolve from inaccuracy or uh, 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 of scripture if you will failure even to receive of the mercies of God and his divine uh, uh, provisions if you will can, uh, can uh, be uh, 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 can be uh, destroyed, amen, or, or, or we can fail to receive a God's blessings if we uh, don't rightly divide the word of truth. We need accuracy. Will y'all hang with me just a little bit? I'm going to challenge your minds. I, I want you to be with me. Please don't crucify me till I get done. Will y'all promise y'all won't crucify me? Y'all with me? All right, here we go. There is a phrase oft times that is used that needs examination. The phrase is this, God responds to faith. It sounds good. It's been repeated thousands of times. I've used it. You've used it. We've preached it. But is it scriptural? There is no place that you'll find in the Bible that phrase. There's nowhere in scripture where you'll find in the Bible. I know y'all fixing to crucify me. My own assistant pastor about crucified me when I said this. But there's no place in scripture you will find that God responds to faith. It's not to be found there because it's not there. You can't find. It's just simply, my friend, inaccuracy of scripture. It's an inerrant uh, def, uh, interpretation, if you will, of the word of God. Nowhere in scripture will you find that God responds to your faith, if you will. Problem with the statement is this. If God responds to my faith, then based upon my faith, God will minister to me therefore my faith becomes uh, the, the instigator or becomes the actuator of the hand of God 
If God responds to my, y'all with me now, okay? I, I don't look, you're, you're not, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preach to you. Me and you, gonna, we're going to have fun together. If God responds to my faith, then that means I can have anything I want to if I can faith it enough. If God responds to my faith, then if I have faith, I can get anything I want. God becomes a little, a little puppet in heaven that I can manipulate with my faith when I want to and how it pleases me. Ha, 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 ho. I'm still in the book. Amen. If God responds to my faith, then hey, folks, we got a problem because, because it's just not accurate. The problem is this. If we minister that, if we teach that, then it causes a disillusionment in the minds of people because there's a lot of good people who have faith in God, but they don't get the things that they desire and seek for of God. I know ministers who have plenty of faith who passed away from the, from the, from the clutches because of the clutches of cancer. I've known good people who bad things have happened to them, but they had faith in God. I'm telling you tonight, we need to get the accuracy of the word of God. We need to get back to the book. We need to find out what truth is. See, if the devil can cause you to believe a lie and become disillusioned, he can destroy your soul. If the devil can cause you to believe an accuracy of God's nature or the working of God's mercy, then, then there's a possibility of delusion. There's a possibility of anger. There's a possibility of frustration. All of these things that can corrupt and to destroy that blessed hope that we have in Christ Jesus. See, Scripture tells us that God responds to love. Not my love to him, but God responds according to his love for me. John chapter 3, verse 16. God so the world that he gave his only begotten son. Amen. John chapter 1 and verse 3. Behold what manner of the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Romans 5, 6, and 8. Amen. For when we were yet, when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for the righteous man one would die, but peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God committed his love towards us and that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us if you will. Folks you need to understand God ministers and he responds to us according to his love. He ministers to us according to his love. God committed his love towards us that he gave his only begotten son. We didn't faith it in, into existence. We didn't believe it that it could happen. We didn't sit around in a think tank and say I think this is the way it should be. No, God says, I, I see a people who I love. I know there's only one way to help them in their dilemma and in their plight. I'll move and minister to them in their time of need. And God responded out of love for me and you. Can you say praise the Lord? Praise God. Now, John, Matthew chapter 9. Verse 36, but when he saw the multitude, talking about Jesus, he was moved with compassion on them because they, they, were, they fainted and were scared. He moved every time God did, or Christ Jesus, see that? Accuracy of Scripture. Every time Christ Jesus did a miracle in Scripture in the New Testament, you'll find that he did it because he was moved with love towards them. He was moved with compassion. Look at uh, Matthew chapter 20, if you will. Verse 34, And Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes, and immediately their eyes received sight, and they followed him. Mark chapter 1 and verse 41 says this, And Jesus moved with compassion, put forth his hand, and touched him, and said unto him, I will be thou clean. Amen. Oh, saints of God, we need to understand. God ministers to us and he responds to us according to his love. Luke chapter 7 and 13. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said unto her, weep not. And then he, he moved and there was a miracle wrought in her life. Hey, I'm telling you people tonight, God responds to his love. It's his love which brings about his move towards us. Do, we, do I believe in faith? Oh yes. I'm going to get to that. Hang on. I believe in faith. I believe in the necessity of faith. But we don't need to get the cart before the horse. 
Somebody said, don't get the cart before the horse. I did a foolish thing. I got the, house, uh, the horse before the house. Now, go figure that one out. That's really bad, isn't it? Have a horse and no house. Amen. God responds to us according to his love. Even look at Mark chapter 9. And Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Hath thou my unbelief? His faith was imperfect. And if God responds to faith, he could have never received his blessings. But God was moved. Christ Jesus was moved with compassion towards him and, uh, and delivered him from that dumb and deaf spirit and, uh, and deliberated that young child. I'm trying to tell you, saints of God, tonight that God responds to us according to his love. So what is the operation of faith in the equation? Hebrews 11, 6 says this, for with, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Hey, folks, faith is critical. Faith is irreplaceable. Faith must be in the equation. So what is faith's operation, if you will? Here we go. Y'all with me still? Getting quiet. I must be in your thinking or hearing and listening, I hope. And nobody's snoring yet. Hey, Amen. Amen. Faith is the arena in which God operates. Love is the source from which his blessings flow. Faith facilitates love to be manifest in our life. Faith doesn't buy it. Faith doesn't earn it. Faith doesn't make it happen. Faith just allows God to work in our life. Let me, let me go here. Now, listen to this. We are physical. God is spiritual. Y'all with me? We are physical. God is spiritual. If God were physical, then we would reach out our hands physically and receive of God's blessings. We couldn't receive unless we extended our hands. Y'all with me? But God is not physical. God is a spirit. Jesus said that, if you will. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. So, how do we take hold of the blessings of God? Well, we can't do it physically. We have to do it spiritually. So faith is our opening up of our hearts, of our hands to say, here I am, Lord. I trust you. I believe in you. I know you can do it. I know you're going to take care of my need. You're going to move in my situation. You're going to supply all my needs. But love, it's the love of God that moves when you and I have a need. And faith opens up the corridors of God's love to be manifest. Oh, no, you didn't hear me. I said I said faith opens up the corridors for love to be manifest in my life. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Okay. I just want you to understand. I'm going to go back. I'm going to backtrack a little bit because now you're with me. Y'all didn't believe me a while ago, but now you're with me. I just want to backtrack to help you understand that faith, amen, we can't faith it from God. We can't faith it from God. We cannot exercise dominion over God with our faith. I say we cannot exercise dominion over God with our faith. You can't positive mental attitude it from God. You can't wrestle it from the hand of God. God is sovereign. That means he can do what he wants, when he wants, and how he wants. You know what that means, friend? That means, uh, hey, we're going to have to rely on his providence. We're going to have to rely on his love. We're going to have to rely on him, amen, to move in our situation. But I have a word for you tonight. You don't have to worry whether God's on your side. You don't have to worry whether God loves you. You don't have to worry if God wants to bless you. I've got a word from the Lord. Hey, listen to me tonight. Why don't you just have faith because God loves you. Why don't you just open up the corridors of God's provision and believe God's love is for you? Why don't you believe he loves you? 
Why don't you open up your heart and say, I believe it. He loves me. He, he, hey, he loved me. Even before I knew him, he loved me. Praise God. Praise God. Oh, it's a simple message. It's not very profound. Oh, but it's, it's, it's so very powerful. God operates in the arena of faith. Romans chapter 1. Praise God. I think it's in Romans chapter 1. I done got lost up here. Somebody look at me and say, get straight, brother. Romans chapter 1. For there is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. For it is written, the just shall live by faith. You understand, folks, that faith God operates in the arena of faith. But faith is not the instigator. Faith is not what, what God moves God. It is his love towards us that moves him. Amen. Galatians chapter 3 tells us this. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident for the just shall live by faith. What I'm trying to get across to you tonight with the help of the Lord is this is that you need to have faith in God's love you need to have faith in God's love you don't need to have faith in God giving you a Cadillac you need to have faith in God's love you don't need to have faith in what God will or will not do you don't need to sit around in a think tank and say I believe God for a million dollars you don't need to sit around and say hey I think it ought to be this way so I'm going to believe God for him to move this way Hey, if you do that, you're going to be disillusioned. You're going to be upset because his ways are higher than my ways. He sees what my eyes do not see. But if you can just back up and Holy Ghost sit there in the peace of God and say he loves me he's going to supply for my need I don't understand how it's going to work out I don't understand how it's going to move I don't know how it's going to all happen I don't understand where it's going to come from I don't know where the miracle is going to be supplied from but I know I know that my God loves me and he will never leave me or forsake me he is a friend that sticks closer than a brother if you can just learn to walk by faith And the blessings of God will be abundantly, amen, moved and placed and put on within and with on your life. Simple message. Have faith God loves you. I've seen people become disillusioned in their walk with God because they try to put God in their little, in their little, in their little quadrille of, of comprehension. They would say in the Holy Ghost, Brother Smith, I'm financially stretched and strapped, so I'm going to believe God that he'll help me win the lottery. I don't know if anybody's won the lottery yet, but I've never known the righteous to be forsaken. I've never known their seed begging for bread because God loves them and God loves you and God supplies all of our needs according to his riches and glory. Are y'all with me here? Come on. Hey, I've never understood, hey man, why God sometimes heals and sometimes he doesn't. I have a precious man in my church, my assistant pastor right now. His name is uh, Kidder. He comes out of, uh, out of uh, Arkansas, out of the Little Rock area. His dad, a mighty man, powerful preacher of the gospel there in an adjacent city nearby. A man was struck with cancer about the same time as another pastor just a few miles from where he lived was struck with cancer. Two pastors in the same section of the same district of the United Pentecostal Church godly men I'm telling you who were struck with cancer one of them today is still living ministering in his congregation one has gone on to meet his maker if we say not my faith can manipulate the hand of God somebody's going to be disillusioned but it doesn't happen that way God's love moves in our life I don't understand why brother Kidder went on to see the Lord I don't understand why his his, uh, his uh, way was chosen by God to be as it was. I don't know why Brother Cox was able to continue in his ministry before the Lord. But I do know one thing. He loves me. He loves you. He loves him. 
He always supplies. He always has a will. He always has a reason. He can always move. He can always deliver. But he will do. Don't you take, don't you take the sovereignty out of the, out of the equation. Don't you take the, the word of God and cause it and wrestle it to inaccuracy. But allow the word of God to minister to you. I've come tonight simply to say to somebody, I'm fixing to sit down. I'm about done. I just came tonight to tell somebody. I don't know where you are. I don't know what your situation, but God knows where you are. I don't know what problems you're facing. I don't know what situation you're facing, but God knows and God loves you. Have faith. God loves you. I don't know what he's going to do. He may let you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, but he'll be with you. I don't know. He may raise you up and he may raise you up in healing. He may deliver you. You may win the lottery tomorrow. He may put it all okay. But he may be like Paul and Peter and say, my grace, my love, my grace is sufficient for you. Oh, saints of God. God loves you. Trust him. Trust him. Trust him. See, grace... Grace is the extension of the extended arm of God's love. Grace is the manifest love of God. On our text this evening, in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8, it says this, For by grace are you saved. Come on, help me now. By faith. Through faith. Through the corridor. The arena. But it was grace that saved you and I. Grace is the extended, the extension of God's love towards you. Grace is unmerited favor. It is God favoring you even though you're unworthy of it. It's God showing you kindness even though you, you, you're vile and full of sin. It was God saying, I love you. Amen. I'll move in your behalf. I'm telling you tonight, if you came to a repentance before the Lord, if you were filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, it's because grace found you. It's because the love of God found you. It's because God loved you. And you said, you know what? I believe he loves me. I'll just let him do in me according to his will. And it didn't take very long for grace to begin to bubble up within your soul as a well of living water. And new tongues begin to be uttered upon your mouth. And oh, old things were passed away and all things were made new why because God responds and his love towards you faith just says let it be so be it so be it I have trust in you oh somebody help me now I never marveled the story of, 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 of Paul I know I've already mentioned it I have never mar ceased to marvel the story of Paul when the Bible says that he was given a, a, a thorn in the flesh, a, buff, uh, a buffer of Satan, if you will, to keep him humble. And the Bible says that thrice he sought the Lord, that God would deliver him of that affliction. We don't know what it was, whether it was uh, uh, blindness, physical blindness, we don't know what it was. Whether it's a health uh, uh, infirmity, whether it was a spiritual thing, uh, we, we just really don't know what it was. But, but... But three times Paul sought the Lord. Deliver me, Lord, from this thorn of flesh. Deliver me, Lord. If we had the idea that God responds to faith, then we'd look at that situation and say, God failed. You're going to tell me that Paul didn't have faith? You're going to tell me the great man of God that wrote half, more than half of the New Testament was a faithless man? That God wouldn't respond to him when he prayed? He went to his death perhaps with that thorn in the flesh. Amen. Not because he was faithless. Not because he was faithless. But because God responds to us in love. He responds out of love. And love said, you need something to keep you humble. You need something to keep you saved. You need something to keep you rooted and grounded. To keep your feet on the ground. But love did not desert him. 
Lord did not desert him because God said my grace the manifest hand of God's love my grace is sufficient unto you my strength is made perfect in their weakness there are times God will let us go through the trial there's times he'll let us go into the fire of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego it's not because he doesn't love us it's because he does love us and he will allow him his love to be manifest in our life all we have to do is trust him praise God brother Smith you don't believe you're going to tell me that you don't believe in the, in the gift of faith I believe in the gift of faith. I'm not talking about the gift of faith. I'm talking about general faith and walk with God. I believe in the gift of faith. I see the gift of faith uh, in, in the story of Gideon who looks at the moon and the stars and the sun and says, stand still. That, my friend, was a gift of faith. I look at the gift of faith and other stories of, Eli uh, of, uh, of Elijah that says, you know, it ain't going to rain no more, Ahab. That's a gift of faith. I'm not talking about gift of faith. I'm talking about the just living by faith. I'm talking about what you and I have to do every day of our lives. What we need to, to do, walking in faith. Amen. Staying in a, in a mind of faith and confidence to God. Oh, saints, I know it's so simple. I know it's, not, it's so elementary. I know it doesn't challenge your apostolic minds, but it's so profound, so powerful, and so true that wherever you are tonight God has not forsaken you God loves you and God is there with you for some he will deliver from the fire for some he will go through the fire but with all he will never leave or forsake for he's a friend that sticks closer than a brother the Bible tells us, amen, that he laid down his life for you and I, if you will. Amen. Greater love hath no man than this, than a man would lay down his life for a friend. That's the kind of love I'm talking about tonight. That God would come, manifest himself, and robe himself in flesh, and dwell among us, and give his life for your stead and my stead. That's how much he loves us. How about what, what uh, Proverbs tells us, amen, hath the friend must show, must show himself freely, but there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. That's my Christ Jesus he's talking about who sticks closer than a brother. I've got friends. I've got neighbors. I've got, I've got relatives. I've got sisters. I don't have a brother except for you. If you want to be my brother, you can be my brother. But I tell you what, if somebody called me in distress, I would do everything with my ability to be there to help them. If one of my sisters called me and said, hey, somebody stepped on my toe. They hurt my feelings. I would stomp you like a like a cockroach because I love my family I love my sister but I've got a God who's just the same he says I'll never leave you I'll stick closer than a brother I'll be with you in the darkest times I'll be with you in the trials of life I'll be there when nobody else is there when all have forsaken you I'm your friend I love you praise God praise God Hebrews chapter 13 and 5, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee or forsake thee. You mean when I have a thorn in the flesh, you're still there? Yeah. When, when I'm standing over the casket of a, of a loved one that's passed on, you're still there? Yeah. Did you fail me in that time? No. No. I just have a plan you don't understand. I just have a ways that you cannot comprehend. What about the situation, Lord? I'm facing at the job. Don't you worry about it. I'll supply all you because I love you. But God, I'm under the heat right now. Where have you gone? I believed you for a miracle. I believed you for a divine intervention. What's happening, God? Do you not love me? Oh, he loves you. But love sometimes allows you to go through the trials. Love sometimes allows you to go through the hardships. I got a call yesterday. I was in my parents' home. Some people called me up that I pastor. I don't pastor them anymore. They moved out of this town. But they oftentimes call me up in situations and for advice. And when they have a situation... 
she got on the phone. I could hear the stress in her voice and said, Brother Smith, I need your prayer. I said, what's, what's wrong, sister? I said, are you okay? Yes, I'm fine. Your husband okay? Yes, I'm fine. I said, what's wrong, sister? She said, well, my daughter, she's hooked on, uh, on meth. She's hooked on that, that awful drug. And, and I just, I'm just so brokenhearted. I don't understand. She's a godly woman who loves God. She's a woman that prays. She's a woman of faith. Why, God, have you not answered my prayer to save my young daughter? Why, God, have you allowed her to go through the trials? I, I, on the phone there it took about five minutes I said now listen sister this is what you need to do the first thing you need to do you need to call the cops call the police department and get them and turn her in let her know let the world know let the police department know that she's hooked on the methamphetamines and that she she's a drug addict she needs to understand the consequences of her action she needs to understand that 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 narcotic brings about some 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 consequences amen and so, so she said I I have fully intend to do that. I said, sister, when she goes to jail because she's uh, using drugs or pushing drugs, uh, just, just stay close enough to comfort her. But don't you intervene and don't you get in the way of the consequences of her action. Let her feel the weight of her action. Sometimes God lets us learn lessons uh, the hard way. Sometimes he allows us uh, and somebody once said, love's got to be tough uh, and God allows us to learn. Uh, amen. From the hardships of the things that we bring upon ourselves. God will not always deliver you in the midst of the storm. Sometimes he'll be your help. He'll be your strength. He'll be your comfort that goes through the storm, Paul. He's not going to stop the winds and the waves for you this time, but he's going to let you go on through. I'm telling you tonight, hey, you've got to rely on the love of God even when you don't understand. You've got to rely on the love of God when it don't make sense. You've got to rely on the love of God he has not withdrawn his love he has not forsaken you he has not left you alone he's with you in the darkest hour three Hebrew boys was he there Daniel in the lion's den did he deliver Daniel from the lion's den no Daniel went down in the lion's den my book says that anyway. But was he there? Because his grace is sufficient. Because he loved them. Because he cared for them. Romans chapter 8 tells us this. Who? This is, this is where I really take heart. Shall separate us from the love of Christ. There's no way that you can be alienated from his love. No, you didn't get that. There's no way that you could be alienated or separated or isolated outside of the confines of his love. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation? Can I come into a problem so great that God will cease to love me and leave me alone? Can, can distresses in my life cause the love of God not to be manifest to me? No, his love is manifest to you even in the trial. When I face persecution and people look at me funny and make fun of me because I'm apostolic and dress in appearance and tongue talking, does that mean that God's love has been withdrawn from me? No, you can't separate yourself from the love of God. Famine or nakedness, or peril, or sword. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all of these, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Can I just, just kind of reiterate it one more time? Have faith. God loves you. We have cheapened love so much in our generation. We have cheapened love to be an emotion that sometimes you feel and sometimes you don't feel. But let's get back to the Word of God for a second. Love is not an emotion. Love is a, 
is a self-sacrifice, a willful giving of yourself to somebody else for their stead. 1 Corinthians 13 tells us this, love seeketh not her own. That is the definition of love. Love says, I prefer you over me. I will take care of you at, the, at, the, at my own sacrifice and, and my own uh, 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 trial. Or, or, uh, I will do whatever it takes to take care of you. God's not worried about taking care of his reputation. He's worried about taking care of his children. He's not worried. He's not, oh, please, come on, help me now. He's not worried about uh, whether his kingdom's going to reign and rule. Oh, he's, he's, he's worried about you being his child and being provided for. When God says he loves you, that means uh, he will give of himself for your stead, even to his own hurt and to his own sacrifice that means whatever it takes to move in your situation because he loves you he will intervene he will move even though uh, even though it costs him dearly even to the cross of Calvary I'm trying to get across a very simple message tonight God loves you just have faith. Just trust him. Just, just, just rest in his provision. Don't try to figure it out. Don't try to make it happen the way you want it to happen. Don't frustrate his grace by trying to make him fit into your bottle of provision. I want it done this way and that way and the other. Okay. I'll give one more chance. I uh, instituted something that I think should, it's a real positive thing. I like it. I, I talked to the church in Cedar Lake and said, hey, church, let's, let's all get a quarterly. Let's get all get a book, a ledger. And what we'll do, saints, is that we'll, we'll, we'll put our prayer request down in that book. And then we'll watch God move. And what, what we have need of, salvation of loved ones or physical healing or whatever it might be that you have need of, just write it down in your little prayer book there and it'll help you to stay on track to pray and to, to know how to pray and for what to pray. And moreover, when God moves and intervenes, you will see and recognize the hand of God. Well, I know I'm 45 years old, but I'm 45 years old young. And so I said, you know what, God? I like recreation. I think God likes recreation. Anybody play golf? You ever felt the Holy Ghost in the golf? What do they call that? The golf? Golf? It's not golf field. It's what? Golf course. There we go. Yeah. You think that's a sin playing golf? Absolutely not. Recreation is a good thing. Even God himself instilled the necessity of a, of a Sabbath day rest. It's needful. We need it. So I decided, God, I need something to kind of kind of help me out here. I, I get stressed, and I've tried a lot of things. One, one time, there was a man in my church got, to, got the idea that he wanted to start building model airplanes, the kind with motors that operated by, by remote control. We bought one together. They're, they're a little expensive, and on pastor's budget, it's not always possible to play a lot, but we bought one together and put it all together and cranked it up. It sounded good, got gas in it, it sounded good, and he left. I said, I'll fly this thing. Oh, Brother Roy, yeah, we need another plane. After we bought a couple planes and he buried one and I buried one, we decided that wasn't a very good way of recreation. Somebody else said, hey, man, let's go out plinking. So I went out and I bought a firearm. I bought one I firearm, bought two, and then I found out that firearm shooting guns can get pretty expensive. When you pull the trigger and you spend two bucks, that's ooh, you know, it's a little more than a pastor's budget can handle. So I, uh, I said, well, let's, let's do this. Let's, uh, I'll start, uh, I'll start uh, working on my own bullets. I'll start making my own bullets. So I did that, and I found out that when, when you make one every 10 minutes, you know, time is something a pastor don't have, so that didn't really work either. So, so here I got all the firearms in my closet. Can't use them, get tired of them, and uh, I 
uh, this doesn't quite meet the need. That help me relax. And I don't like to play golf. Okay. So I told the Lord, Lord, I want a four-wheeler. I did. Well, all I can do is say no. And so I said, Lord, I don't want a four-wheeler. God, I want this. I want a Kawasaki uh, 750 brute force four-wheeler. Only costs eight, nine, ten thousand dollars $10,000. It would have to be a miracle. I believe in miracles. And uh, so I prayed about it, put it down my book. And I just waited and, and look at it and pray about it and put it down my book. Hey, man, if you don't ask, you'll never receive. That's what Jesus said, wasn't it? So I said, you know, I just might as well ask for the moon. He may give it to me. And uh, so one day, I was driving down the road, and I saw this sign, horse for sale, best offer. I said, oh, man, that sounds like a neat thing. I never had a horse. So I go up there, and I put a bid in for a horse, ridiculously low price. And so they looked at me and said, okay, you can have a horse. I went back to my prayer book and I looked at my prayer book and said, God, you didn't give me a four-wheeler, but you gave me a four-hoofer. I guess your providence and your ways are higher than my ways. And you know what I need. I'm trying to get across tonight that God's not always going to do what you want him to do. He's not always going to supply in the fashion you want him to supply. But he loves you. He'll meet your needs. He'll be there in your time of trouble. He'll be there in the day of stress. Nothing, I said nothing can separate you from the love of God. Come on, stand with I'm closing. I've said enough. You've heard it. You've got it. Amen. But Paul, but Paul said this in Philippians. He said, but my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. My God is going to supply all that you have need of. If you'll trust him. If you'll allow him to manifest his love to you. And rest in his mercies. And confidence in his provisions. The just shall live by faith. Every day is a walk of faith. I don't understand what tomorrow brings. I don't know what tomorrow holds. But one thing I do know for sure. I know who holds my tomorrow. I've come tonight, I think, with a very simple thought to talk to somebody who does not understand why they're going through the situation that they're going through. People of faith and people of consecration, people of, of good spiritual character who are not seeing the hand of God move in their situation in the fashion and the way they think he ought. And I just come with a simple, simple word, and I'm going to sit down. It's not that he doesn't love you. He does love you. And he sees what you really need. He understands the real situation. He sees beyond where you see. His ways are higher than your ways. And I just come tonight to reaffirm you. Trust him. That's all. Just trust him. But I want him to do it this way. Sorry. He's sovereign. You're not going to move him with your puppet stick. You're not going to faith it and manipulate him by your positive mental attitude or your faith. You're just going to have to rely upon his love and say, Lord, I trust you. When was the last time you went to an altar of prayer and said, Lord, you know my need. But instead of Lord dictating to you how I want you to move and resolve my need, I just want to lay my need before you and let you take care of it. <laughs> When's the last time you went to an altar somewhere and said, Lord, I don't understand how it's going to, can, can be unraveled. It's so complex and such a mess. I don't see how it could even unwind and unravel. But, but God, I know you love me and you are the omnipotent King of Kings. Here it is, Lord. I trust you and I trust your love for me will take care of my need. Come on, somebody. We need to find ourselves a place to pray tonight, an altar of prayer, and say, Lord, I'm going to stop trying to dictate to you to move in the way that I want you to move. But I'm coming tonight, Lord, to just trust you. I'm coming, Lord, tonight to trust you because I know that your word says you love me. 
And there's nobody, no thing that can separate me from your love. And as long as he loves you, he's going to supply your needs. As long as he loves you, he will never forsake you. As long as he loves you, he's going to meet you in your time of trouble. Come on tonight. Would you find a place to pray with me? I know I haven't boggled your mind with deep theology and and I have not been the most eloquent tonight perhaps that I have in times past but would you just find a place to pray around here and let the Lord minister to you one more time would you just rest in his providence and his love and, and not frustrate yourself over trying to make him work in your preconceived fashion as you have a notion he ought you may go to the trial but he's going to be there with you you may keep that thorn in the flesh but his grace is sufficient come on he loves you hallelujah hallelujah I'm not